bonkers and her not understanding what I was witnessing. Rory, please walk us through it. So I know I kind of skipped over the second half of the, the season, but I, it's just because I'm excited to talk about this game. I'm just really excited to talk about this game. I remember watching it at home and I was watching it with my uncle, who is a Manchester United fan, and that made it a lot more enjoyable to watch because as the game... So the way the game was set... Um, before, so before the game, United and City were both level on points. City were ahead on goal difference. Okay, United were playing away to Sunderland and... City were playing at home to QPR. Now, QPR were fighting for their survival. Sunderland had already secured their survival by this point, but QPR were still in a relegation dogfight. And people still thought, obviously, that City would win this. Even before the game, the, kind of, the journalists were talking to Mancini and saying, do you think you've got one hand on the trophy? He was very magnanimous and said, I'm not saying anything until the game's over. But... It seemed like it was a done deal. But even without, even with that involved, the drama, nobody could have seen the drama coming. So United beat Sunderland 1-0 away in a fairly routine win. But the key thing is that their game finishes before Manchester City game finishes, okay? So have in the back of your mind, United have won, okay? They are waiting to see what happens at the Etihad. So let's go kick off. City are playing QPR. And the first half is quite slow, nervy. But all of a sudden, Zabaleta, a Manchester City icon, gets his first goal of the season to put Man City 1-0 up. And you can see in the stands, the Man City fans are thinking it's written in the stars. Or one of our favourite players has got his first goal of the season, we're going to win it. But QPR had different ideas. In the second half... Lescott makes a horrific error, miss, misses a header, and Gibral Cisse, if you remember that guy, slips in to equalise, making it 1-1. And all of a sudden, all the City fans who have seen City disappoint them so many times in the past are thinking, typical City, we're going to stuff it up. But the game continues, and Joey Barton, ex-Man City man who was kicked out of the club for being a massive wanker, is sent off for elbowing Tevez. It was definitely, looking back, it was in the penalty area, but anyway, a free kick is given. Um, Nothing comes of it. There's a break, and Mackey, Jamie Mackey, scores again on the break to make it 2-1 to QPR. They have two attacks, two goals, and all of a sudden, Man City are looking really, really in trouble. And at this point, my uncle was feeling pretty smug with himself, He's, he's seeing the United score, they're 1-0 up, and he's thinking, we've got this in the bag, City have stuffed it, they're always going to be our little brothers, like our little neighbours, they can fuck off kind of thing. But, again, watching it on, again, I didn't realise just how late it was, like just how late it was. So Balotelli comes on in like the 75th minute, and to be fair to him, he does change the game. All of a sudden, he has three or four chances that, he, that should be put away. Paddy Kenny in goal for QPR has a blinder. And the equaliser for Dzeko comes in the 92nd minute. So up to the 92nd minute, City are losing. The United game's already finished. They're trying not to dance on the pitch. And then, of course, the moment that I very rarely celebrate other teams' goals. Like, very, very rarely. I think this might be one of three times I've ever done it in my life. But I I checked on the highlights, the 94th minute and 51st second of five minutes added time, Aguero, with Balotelli's only assist of the season, scores it for that Aguero moment. And the scenes, not just in the stand, but on the pitch, you see Joe Hart, the keeper, running in circles. like They just don't know what to do with themselves. They cannot believe this is how they've won the title. And I think... For Man City, for it to be their first Premier League title and to win it in that way, I think that's the best way to win a title. I know it's horrible when you think you're 2-1 down, you might lose it, but that way to win anything, I think, is the best. I remember in front of my uncle, who wasn't particularly pleased that I was celebrating, just screaming, jumping up in my living room, like, yeah, yes, I can't. It was the best ending to a Premier League season, hands down. Now, if we're going to talk beyond Premier League, I wanted to give an honourable mention to the 1988-89 season because, of course, Arsenal won it and I want to give it a shout. But I just wanted to say, 
that this is the only time that I can think of in a league title where the top two teams, so the only two teams who can win the league, have played each other in the last game of the season to decide the title, right? Now, obviously, because of this season, there was the Hillsborough disaster and Liverpool there was, like, was not in a good place. The, the fixture had been postponed. So all the rest of the league had already played their games, right? For the rest of the teams, the season was over. This, was a late, this game was a week after the season had been done. So it's like a cup final for the title, right? I don't know how many times you get this. I can't think of another example like this. There, I haven't seen, like, doing the research for this episode, I, I, off the top of my head, I had a few seasons in mind, and then I looked, and there are some crazy endings to seasons. Like, mm. I'm going to mention a few when we talk about the Serie A. But, yeah, there, are, there, are, there have been quite some interesting, like, last match days to decide the title. Super interesting. So the, the facts I wanted to go through. So Arsenal had to beat Liverpool 2-0 away at Anfield. Okay. Now this was Liverpool at the peak of their powers. Liverpool hadn't lost at Anfield by two goals or more in three years. Okay. They had Ian Rush and Aldridge up front who had never lost together for Liverpool. And Arsenal hadn't won at Anfield for 15 years when this game was played. Right. The Daily Mirror, before the game was, like, the, the day before the game, their, their headline was, Arsenal, you don't have a prayer. Like, everybody just thought, Liverpool are going to win this game. Like, it's a certainty. Now, if you haven't seen the documentary, find it on Amazon, 89. Not just as an Arsenal fan, as a sports documentary, it is an unbelievable documentary. Even the way they cover the, the Hillsborough disaster, it's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful doc. But we all know how the game ends. 92nd, 93rd minute, Lee Dixon puts in Alan Smith, who puts in Michael Thomas, who gets very lucky with a very lucky deflection. But he manages to chip it over, wins the game 2-0, has one of the worst celebrations because I think he just doesn't know what to do. He like flops like a fish on the floor. But anyway, that was just another season that I wanted to give a memorable shout out. They're both kind of similar endings to, um, to the season, but I wanted to remind people that football wasn't invented in 1993 and there were great title chases before the Premier League was invented. Great. And that takes us to the Serie A. So when Rory and I came up with this title for our weekly topic, closes the title races um we i thought about a few seasons so the first season that came to my mind was the 2007 2008 season in which inter milan managed to win the title on the very last match day and it was very interesting because inter were playing away at parma roma were playing away at away at catania and both roma and inter could win the title and both Parma and Catania could be relegated. So those were two key fixtures. On the last match day, Mancini was refusing to play Ibrahimovic because there had been some problems in the locker room. And then apparently Inter were drawing nil-nil at halftime. Roma were winning against Catania. And apparently hell broke loose in Inter's locker room. Patrick Vieira notably refused to play unless Ibrahimovic was going to come in. I think some player tried to hit Mancini. Mancini in the end was just like, fuck it, you decide whatever you want. You want Ibrahimovic to play, fine. Ibrahimovic came on, scored two goals, and the Inter won the title. That was the first title race that came to my mind. The second one was the 2011-2012 title race between AC Milan and Juventus. We can dedicate an episode only to that happening of the... Sule Muntari's goal that was not ruled for some reason as a goal and Juventus won against AC Milan in one of the most controversial wins in the Serie A but the one season with the closest title race that I could think of is the 2001-2002 season. Now, this is back in the time when Serie A was the league. So much talent Every year, a different winner. It was a super interesting league and arguably the best league in the world. Rory, will you agree with this one? Yeah, I think this is kind of coming towards the end of the era of Serie A being the greatest league, but it still was at that time. Of course, like the 90s Serie A dominated. And I think, yeah, leading into that, 
I've I've always watched Serie A, um, and I remember it being, yeah, ridiculously strong this year. So yeah, in, just to give you an idea, in ninety seven ninety eight Juventus win the title. In ninety eight ninety nine AC Milan win the title. In ninety nine two thousand Lazio win the title. In two thousand two thousand one Roma win the title. Which one is the team mm-hmm. missing? Inter Milan, of course, who had not won a title since eighty eight eighty nine. So we're walking into the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, sorry, I just I didn't realize it's been that long. That My was God, Inter's longest title drought. Yup. So we're at the beginning of the two thousand one two thousand two season. Roma have won the previous season. That was their third title. A certain Hernan Crespo was the top goal scorer of the previous season with twenty six goals for Lazio. Roma, coached by Fabio Capello, Postman Pat, correct? Postman Pat, I'm so glad you've remembered that. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that. He was the coach at Roma. Of course, they were the favorites. They had won the title the year before. They had players of the likes of Samuel Candela Cafu in defense, Tommasi De Rossi, who was 18 at the time. And the young De Rossi. Emerson, yeah, and Emerson at midfield. Attack, Montella, Totti, Battistuta, Del Vecchio. And that summer, they also got a certain Fantantonio Cassano. Now, their defense with Samuel, Candela, and Cafu, not strong enough. They brought in also Christian Panucci from Monaco. So I can just say, this is the first Italian team, like that actual team of Roma that I absolutely fell in love with. All of those players, Emerson, Candela, Battistuta, Montella, I loved every last one of them. I thought that was such a great, exciting team. They really should have won more, but anyway. So yeah, that was Roma, the Roma's team. They were the title favorites. Who were the other title favorites? Juventus and Inter. Now, Juventus had just got rid of Carletto Ancelotti as their manager, and they had brought in Lippi for his second spell at Juventus after two not very successful year, actually zero successful year at Inter Milan. That summer, Juventus had gotten rid of Zidane to Real Madrid, which at the time was the most expensive transfer ever made. And they had also gotten rid of Inzaghi to AC Milan. But who had they brought in? Buffon and Turam in defense from Parma and the Nedved and Salas from midfield. So it was really a revolution for Juventus. So were all of those transfers from Parma? No, just two. No, 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 no. Buffon and Turam, Nedved and Salas okay. came from Lazio. Yeah. Ah, okay, right. Okay, okay. Yeah. And then the other players that they had, I mean, it was actually Del Piero's first season as a captain. Then they had Trezeguet, who was ready to start, but under Ancelotti, he was kind of misused. And then they had, I mean, Conte, Davids, Ferrara, Montero, Pesotto. They were a very, very solid team. Now, Inter Milan, they had just gotten rid of Lippi as a manager, and they had brought in Hector Cooper, who in two years at Valencia, he had won number one, manager of the Liga, manager of the UEFA Cup, and mm-hmm. he had won the Spanish Super Cup. So the Moratti family kind of tired with not winning anything. They were like, Cooper is going to be our statement signing. He also got Valencia to two Champions League finals, right? Uh, I think that was him, right? He maybe got them to one. I can't remember. He but I remember have. he came He came very close to winning quite a few things. Yeah. yeah, something for you listeners and for us to double check. <laughs> yeah. So Cooper came in. I hate reading about this. Inter just got written off. I'll say it very quickly. Brocchi and a certain Andrea Pirlo who went to AC Milan. But we had brought in Toldo, great goalkeeper Oof. from Fiorentina, Materazzi from Perugia, and Cristiano Zanetti from Roma who had won the title the previous year with the team from the capital. Now, Inter Milan, they had a good team, but they had two problems. The first problem was called Alvaro Recoba. Now, there was a passport scandal in 2001-2002. Some passports had been falsified, so to make foreign players regularly play for Italian teams, undergoing all the rules set up by UEFA. They had been caught, and so Alvaro Recoba had to skip one entire year of his career, and he would be back only in December. The other problem, always with an R, and I wish we had problems like those right now, was Ronaldo. Ronaldo was not fully fit. He had suffered a pretty bad injury the previous season, and he, became, he came back in the squad only in December. 
the rest of the team in defense Inter Milan had Cordoba, Zanetti, 